Hello everyone, welcome to the Learning Enhancement Education webinar series. Before we get started with the formal introductions, I want to give you a couple rules of what's going to go on in the room. As you are entering the room, your phones have been placed on mute, and we will be keeping them that way until it is time for questions. If you have a question during the presentation and the phones are not yet open, feel free to just type the question in the chat area and we will um, see that and be able to respond either then or at the end for questions. You can also try and raise your hand over at the bottom of the screen. Most people find that the chat window works the best. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and then we'll get started. Wrong place to start. Come on, computer. There we go. Okay, everyone, thank you for joining us. This is a webinar on addressing cognitive deficits in Title I students. And your presenters today are myself. I'm Dr. Sarah Sattel. I am the Director of Scientific Affairs with Learning Enhancement Corporation. And joining me on the call is our President and COO at Learning Enhancement, Betsy Hill. Hello, Sarah. It's great to be here today and to have uh, such a great audience and group assembled. Um, I do want to say a couple other things, one of which, um, and Sarah, we are recording, right? Correct. Okay, great. So we are both doing a couple things that will make it easier for you to keep track of what's going on, one of which is that following the webinar, we will be sending out to you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that we are using today. So no one needs to feel like they need to madly scribble down everything that's on the, the uh, PowerPoint slides because you will be receiving that. We also are recording the webinar and we'll be providing a link um, after we get it um, up on our website um, following the webinar. And hopefully that will be within a, a week or so, and you can feel free to review the webinar or to share that with other folks that you know that wanted to be here but maybe couldn't manage to um, get here at this particular time. So what we're going to do today is we're going to be talking about um, what we know about the extent and the causes of the disparities in ability and performance that we see in students from low socioeconomic status background. Um, after we do that, we want to then take a look at some of the approaches that are really now enabling students to close those gaps and those approaches that are informed by um, our expanding knowledge of the brain and how it works. And then finally, what we want to do is build on that understanding and our understanding of the of brain functionality with some principles and practices that can be used in the classroom. Um, of course, because we all have brains, um, they're good for everybody, but they're especially important for this particular population of students. So we can go to the next slide. What we know, um, of course, is that reading is really the underpinning of edu our education system, much of our society for that matter, and that there's a very large proportion of our students who are not um, getting where we need them to get. I was particularly struck by the statistics from a report by the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Uh, first of all, it talks about from the, the transition that happens between third and fourth grade where kids switch from learning to read to reading to learn. Um, what we um, also found in that uh, report is that well over half, 68% of our students are below proficient level uh, by the end of grade four. The worst state in the union, unfortunately, is Louisiana. But the best state, Massachusetts, still has more than half of its students at the end of fourth grade who are not reading a grade level or below the proficient level. The consequences of this are pretty important. Um, if half of the curriculum, and this is what we are told, is incomprehensible to students who are not reading at a proficient level in fourth grade, what about sixth grade? What about eighth grade? What about when they're seniors in high school? 
And I have to think that if I'm a student who is only getting maybe half of what's going on around me, that I'm going to have a hard time staying focused, being motivated, and really trying to, um, to get what's going on because so little of it really has any meaning to me. Unfortunately, when we start talking about low socioeconomic status students, um, the story is even worse. Um, and it doesn't really matter which measure you use. We have two different uh, looks at this here. One is at the level of the school, so Title I schools, or students in Title I schools, and the other looks at the level of the individual student, so all students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. And it, for this uh, group of students, it's much greater than we saw before. In fact, it's something like 80% of students are scoring below proficient. What we couldn't predict, I'm sorry. Okay, I guess I'm just hearing an echo. Uh, <clears throat> what we can predict from that is exactly what we see, in fact, in real life. These data that you're looking at now on this graph are from a Title I school in Gary, Indiana, uh, that we have worked with. And these are the reading scores before any intervention. Um, and what they really show is that by the time students are in fourth grade, they're about a grade level behind on average. By sixth grade, the gap has widened to almost two grade levels. So this is typical, unfortunately, and instead of closing the gap, we see it continue to widen as students move through school. Over the last couple of decades, we can switch slides. Um, research has started to really shed light on the deficits that these low socioeconomic students have um, that they come to school with. And one of the most extensively discussed studies, of course, is Hart and Risley, um, who showed that by the age of three, children from low SES families have heard 30 million fewer words, and that the words that they hear and the tone are much more negative. So, of course, um, we are very cognizant and very aware of those differences, um, and that is caused people to suggest a number of different kinds of responses or solutions. Um, should we put kids in school earlier? That's certainly one suggestion. Well, the evidence doesn't really support that any earlier formal reading instruction. And in fact, students in Finland, which is, has one of the highest literacy rates in the world, doesn't start any formal reading instruction until kids are the age of seven. So that may not really be an answer either. Um, and there are a whole raft of other kinds of approaches that, um, that we have tried. Um, the problem, nonetheless, continues to persist. And while there are some, some bright spots and some things that seem to work for a while, um, the approaches really haven't solved the issue of kids falling farther and farther behind, especially from this population. So if we look at a, an image of how we think about education, and um, we think about the job of education, the challenges we face. Many of you have seen this image, of course, before. It's um, the 21st century skills uh, diagram. And it talks about the fact that we want to educate our students not just about the basics, but about things like critical thinking and creativity and communication and technology and other life skills in addition to the basics. And that the bottom is everything that we, all of the tools that we bring to this, um, trying to achieve these outcomes, things like curriculum and professional development and all the rest. But what really has disappeared, what really strikes me as having, is the missing piece in this picture is the student, that little guy at his desk in the middle of that, of our um, PowerPoint slide now. Because all of this has to happen through those, through that student. And each student in those chairs is different from one another. Each student has a brain, as we'll see on the next slide, uh, born with something between 150 and 200 million neurons. Those brains develop and learn by creating trillions of connections, each one among all those neurons. And while some of that growth is guided by genetics, the environment is much more than incidental. Um, it's specifically our interaction with our environment that causes our brains to grow and to develop and to learn. If you look, therefore, at the, at the kinds of different environments, and these are extremes, so most of our students have not come from 
uh, backgrounds as bad as the, the brain scan on the right. But the nature of the environment does have a tremendous impact. This is a CT scan of the brain of a normal child on the left and one who has suffered extreme neglect on the right. So what you can see here is even the size of the brain has been affected. And as we've learned in recent years about the roles of different parts of the brain, different areas of the brain, and we consider the likelihood that children from low SES um, environments have not experienced the same kinds of um, positive, interactive uh, richness in their environment, we can easily postulate that there would be a much greater impact than just on vocabulary. And in fact, that's exactly the case. What you're seeing here is um, some research by Kimberly Noble at the University of Pennsylvania Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. And what she and her team and other researchers working with her have done is to document the deficits across multiple brain systems. So it's not just the language system in our brain, it's not just our ability to learn and understand words, but it's really um, pervasive across all brain systems from perceiving patterns and visualizing, which is part of our visual system, to perceiving and manipulating spatial relationships, which is partly our parietal and spatial systems, the very um, ability to assemble information from distributed storage, that is remembering things that we've learned, uh, controlling the focus of our attention. Again, you go down system by system, and in each of these areas, they have been able to document deficits in children from low SES backgrounds. Now, if we now think about this in terms of the, of the implications for our students' academic achievement, um, it's pretty sobering. So just, just to, I wanted to take three examples here and talk a little bit about them. And then we're going to go, we're going to come back again to these three specific examples and talk about how these um, deficits can actually be addressed and remediated. So, perceiving patterns and visualizing, how does that impact students' abilities and achievement in the classroom? Well, there are a whole series of nonverbal cognition tasks that we expect students from the basic ability to organize their physical and mental workspace to understanding if we stick our hands on our hips and look sternly at them versus, you know, a, an open smiling face, understanding that nonverbal feedback. And, you know, those are the kinds of situations that can quickly sort of explode or implode if kids aren't getting the right signals from their interactions with others. And then in the very academic sense, just understanding math and science concepts, shapes and relationships and order and things like that. Controlling the focus of our attention. This is a basic skill that we assume, in fact, we have to assume that kids come to classrooms with. And unless there are some real unusual educators on this phone call, I know that all of you have um, issues with kids being able to stay on task, being able to defer gratification, make plans, all the kinds of things that are really part of our attentional control system. And then the third example I wanted to highlight is the ability to retain and manipulate information over a short period of time. This is generally referred to as working memory, and we know that working memory is one of the primary indicators of success academically and the greatest predictor of general intelligence and our ability to learn all kinds of complicated tasks as well as to do reasoning and problem solving to um, understand what we read and really to do a whole variety of learning functions. So hopefully what we're starting to see in looking at these is that in fact um, there's a pretty dramatic impact across many of the things um, that our students um, uh, come to, to our, our classrooms to be able to do. So there are real differences. We have to be real clear. We have to understand the, that um, low SES students come to our classrooms functionally different, that is with different capacity to learn than their more advanced counterparts. Even given good teaching and good curriculum and a safe environment, all the other things that we um, strive so hard to give them, it will still take them much longer to learn what they need to learn to survive and to thrive in school and in life. But here's the punchline. Here's the most important thing. The very plasticity developed the brains that they have can be 
harnessed to actually develop these skills, even when they um, come with these initial deficits. Students with less cognitive ability can still develop it, and really at any age. So what I'm going to do now is turn things over to Sarah, and um, she's going to share with you basically how we do that and how that can happen. So what we want to start out with here is to give, Betsy's given you a really nice idea of why we talk about the cognitive capacity and how it is lower. And so we have some real good examples here from results that people that have been working with us have, have come across. And this is the first example I want to show you. This is a classroom of fourth and fifth grade boys, and we measured their um, cognitive age using some of the subtests of the Woodcock-Johnson Cognitive Battery. And what you see here is what that age is in comparison to their chronological age. The red line across the screen is their age. And what you can see is that these boys that were behind, they were at risk of dropping out of school. Um, they really were in danger of not being able to be able to even graduate middle school, let alone go into high school. And this shows you how significantly behind their cognitive age they were. The other neat thing we know is that we've been doing this and been talking about how you can change the brain in a classroom. And at the same time, Dr. Noble was doing her research. And what she has been quoted in saying or writing in one of her, actually a couple of her papers, is that there as an as yet untested approach to maximizing the efficacy of interventions is to focus programs on those neurocognitive abilities that vary most steeply with SES. She's talking about those abilities that Betsy was referring to earlier. And what we have is a program that does that. Now you're going to see the first set of results. Those same boys that you saw on the previous slide, now we would measured them after they used Brainware Safari. And you can see the improvement, the dark blue bars. The individual results, each of those is an individual student. You can see how all of them grew, some of them significantly in their cognitive ability, achieving over their age for most of them. Some of them just managed to get closer to being able to perform at their age. The average improvement was six years in a three-month time period of our intervention. Now, what I want to point out is what you saw there was cognitive data, and very few schools spend the time to do the Woodcock-Johnson test on their schools, and that's quite understandable. It is very, very time-consuming. So we have a conceptual relationship here for you um, to really explain how cognitive and academic can be related. What you see in the blue line that you can really only see at the, the 12, 13, 14 week here is the, what happens cognitively without any kind of intervention. You just continue to grow at the rate that you're capable of growing, basically. And then what you see is if you add an intervention that is intentional to really impact those particular areas, you can have the kind of cognitive growth that you're seeing here with the red line that says with intervention. And at a three-month period, when you measure it, you have significant difference in the way that they're able to use their brains from when they started. Now, tied in with that is academics. When you're doing this in the classroom, at the same time they're doing brainware, they're also working on academics. And many schools want to measure according to academics. And you do see a change academically, but it, there is a slight lag between when you see the abrupt change with cognitive growth when you're working on an intervention that focuses on those abilities but doesn't focus on reading and math. It's basically adding in to things you're already doing. And what you see is the academic change is the green line, and it's starting to change its slope right around the time of the three months and will continue to climb after that. So let's show you some data that shows you this in a real way. The first thing I want to show you is results from Bailey Elementary School in Gary, Indiana, where we were using the STAR reading assessment and STAR math assessment with their second, third, and in this, what you're seeing here is their sixth graders. And the light blue bars are the students that use Brainware, and the purple bar are the students that did not use Brainware. 
and you're looking at the percentage of students that increased their reading score. So you can see across the board in both reading and math, so you have second grade reading, then second grade math, third grade reading, third grade math, you can see that the BrainWare students in, had more students that increased their reading score significantly with almost 80% in second grade and almost, you know, 80, looks like 85% in third grade. And then in sixth grade, looking at only the students that were underperforming because there were those overachievers that, that, um, were, that we're not looking at here. And you can see in every case, more students increased those scores. The other thing I want to show you is the impact of that lag. And this is data that is fourth graders um, in a, that are targeted Title I students that are in an elementary school in Tucson, Arizona. And the assessment that this school was looking at here was the oral reading fluency assessment from Dibbles. And the only thing we're looking at this for is to see how close they are to the benchmark and to see how that changes between the time they used BrainWare and the time they didn't. So what you're going to see here is two things. These are the same students in third grade and then in fourth grade. And what you're looking at is the fall and spring ORF scores. In the fall of third grade, these, these students scored 55 words per minute, which was about 22 words per minute behind what the benchmark should be. And in the spring, they used BrainWare between winter and spring. In the spring, that they had increased to 80 words per minute, but they were still significantly behind where they should be. In fact, they lost a little bit of ground, and they were 30 words per minute. They did BrainWear in that spring semester, between winter and spring. They went away for the summer. They came back in the fall in fourth grade, and they, they did not do BrainWear in fourth grade. They didn't do BrainWear over the summer. But one of the cool things that we see here is that this group of students had um, only a summer decrease of 10 words per minute when the expected by the benchmark testing is 17. And they scored 70 words per minute. And then in the spring, when they were tested again with their oral reading fluency, they were actually scoring 106 words per minute, which was only 12 words per minute behind, so they were catching up. And the cool thing is you can look at it by looking at the trajectory and see this light blue line is actually the slope of how they were performing in the fall. That's their fall trend. And you can see how that slope has changed when you look at the spring trend between third grade and fourth grade. So you can see that when you have students that are really far behind, using an intervention like BrainWare can have an impact on their academics. It may be a small impact to begin with, barely noticeable in some cases, but then as they continue to use their brains that have now had some cognitive development that they didn't have before, they're much more equipped to be able to handle the material. So what I want to do is I'm just going to take a couple minutes of your time and take you into BrainWare just so you can see the examples of what we're talking about. And we picked a couple of the exercises that focus on those areas that Betsy highlighted. We're going to look at Iguana Lookout, which is about perceiving patterns and visualizing. And then we're going to take a look at Web Weaving, which will show you about controlling focus of one's attention. And then we're going to take a minute and go into Bear Shuffle, and you're going to see how we can develop the ability to retain and manipulate information. So I'm going to switch to BrainWare, and this is a Guana Lookout. So we are looking at um, perceiving problems and visualizing, really building those particular skill sets. And I'm just going to go ahead and walk through the program here. This is level one, and so it's pretty simple, simple for most users. And you just see that there's buttons at the bottom of the screen, and I have 42 seconds as the player to choose the button that is at the bottom of the screen. And you can see they're not in order. The left button isn't on the left. The right button isn't right. Up isn't up. Down isn't down. So you really do have to have the knowledge of which direction you're going and be able to move it along. So this is just making sure that you get your left and right and up and down right. 
we're not really doing a lot of visualizing on this level. Okay, so I passed the level. Good job. I can do that within 42 seconds. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in my cheat code. I'm going to exit here, and I'm going to jump up to a level that lets me show you a little bit more difficulty, where you're getting to see how the the idea behind a good neurocognitive development program is that it's sequenced so that it continues to, to develop the skills. It starts you at a level where you can get good and engaged and, and process that and you pass that and you keep moving and getting more difficult. So this is level five. We work up to level five. You, nobody allow, is allowed to get here unless you have already passed level four. And on this one, I'm going to have three rows of arrows and I'm still going to have a time limit of 42 seconds. But instead of choosing the direction that the arrow is pointing, I have to choose the direction the arrow would be pointing if it were turned 90 degrees to the right. So I click Start Challenge, and instead of up, 90 degrees to the right means that this is pointing right. And instead of right, this one's pointing down. And you can see how this is random generated, by the way. If I get it wrong, I'll get it wrong here. Don't feel. I click Start Challenge, it starts over again. So they, you don't have to worry about them memorizing anything. It's always going to be about making sure that they really do be, are able to visualize that and know which direction is clockwise or to the right and what 90 degrees is. And put all of those concepts together very rapidly because 42 seconds is not a very long time. Okay, I'm going to exit. That's okay. And I'm going to go into web weaving now, and I'm going to jump up to level two so that we can look a little bit at a skill that shows controlling focus and focusing your attention. Now, this exercise works a little bit differently than the arrows that were randomly generated. This one requires me to look at a pattern, and it, then I, the pattern erases, and then I have to hold that pattern in my mind as the player and click to a rhythm five times to a beat, and then after I do that, then I have to recall the pattern from memory and draw the pattern. So there's the attention part where you can't get distracted and it's also working your working memory, which is not just storing information, but retrieving it and manipulating it when, when you um, do retrieve it. So this I have to do six out of 10 times to pass the level. And there was a kind of the head of an arrow. And hopefully, I'm going to turn this up a little bit. You can hear the beat, and you can see the spider. And I have to click to the beat now. One, two, three, four, five times. And now I draw the image. And you can see that I check my answer. I got it right. And then I click Start Challenge and delivered another exercise. And it's similar. Uh, so I have to forget the last one, focus on this one, click to the beat five times, and um, a little message from WebEx popped up in front of me, so I didn't click it. the beat. I clicked the little message. That wasn't good. So you can see how the um, now I have to drop that Im image. I click Start Challenge again, and I get a different one. And so you can see how it's about focusing your attention, storing what you need to store for the length of time you need to store it, and then moving on from there. And I cannot click to the beat and talk at the same time, apparently. Well, that's all right, Sarah. I'll jump in here because one of the things I like to think about, this always reminds me of the situation that we put kids in in a classroom every day, which is that they're looking at visual information on a blackboard or a whiteboard or a smart board or whatever it is, and they're listening to auditory information from the teacher or the, a fellow classmate. And then something happens. The buzzer, the uh, school bell goes off the, between classes or someone brings a message into the room for the teacher or um, a child drops a book on the floor, whatever, and their attention shifts and then they have to bring it back and still be able to have retained all that information we were counting on them to be focusing on before. And that's a wonderful example of, of a skill that we can, we have to rely on kids being able to have, but that you can't really explain to somebody how you can do. Uh, fortunately, you can 
train people to be able to do that much, much more effectively. Okay, and now just to look at Bear Shuffle, um, just one level. We went to level four here because we wanted to be able to show you how you can use something as simple as a video game like this that is designed to do this kind of inform do this kind of brain training where you're building the challenge and really work your working memory and your attention skills and get you to be able to manipulate information in an appropriate way. So this one is basically a card game and there's going to be four cards. They're going to turn face up and then after they turn face down, a couple of them are going to change places. And then after that's done, the player gets to move the cards so that they are in numeric order. So, and we do this seven out of ten times. So we don't just do it once. Nobody guesses in this game. We have to really prove that we have the skill to pass this. Okay, so here we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click Start Challenge, and then the computer will take control, and then I will tell you when I'm allowed to take control again so that you, because you can't see my hands. So you heard, I'm going to click Start Challenge. The cards are turning. It's three, nine, six, two. Now it's nine three six two. Now it's nine six three two. Now I can move the cards. And it's nine six three two and I need to move them in numeric order. So the two goes in front, then the three, and then the six. And you can move them any way you need to move them. I checked my answer and I got that right. So now I get to click 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 start challenge again. And here we go. Two Three, eight, six. So now it should be, I lost my attention, three, two, six, eight, I believe. So I'm going to put the two here, and I think that's right, so I'm going to click check answer. Woo! I lost my attention, but I managed to pull it back. And that's the kind of skill you want your students to be able to develop. You want them to be able to get distracted by a strange noise they weren't suspecting or, like Betsy said, someone drops a book or, heck, some kids are distracted by just someone writing on the piece of paper next to them when they're not writing. And be able to pull back their attention to be able to complete the task that you've asked them to do. And that's just three examples of how Brainware Safari can be used to develop those particular skills. So now what we'd like to do is to shift gears just a little bit and to um, take this group of students who now have stronger cognitive skills and um, <clears throat> at the point where they're now ready to be accelerating in their acquisition of information and knowledge and skills and academic procedures and things like that. Because once our, their brains are working more efficiently, then of course the job of good teaching really gets started. Um, and we want to highlight really three principles for teaching to brains in general, but things that we think are particularly important for the brains of students who come from a low socioeconomic background. So we're talking a little bit about creating meaning. We'll talk about strategies for learning procedures versus information. And we also want to talk about emotions and learning. So let's start off uh, when we start talking about creating meaning, we have to really take an, um, a basic look again at what learning and memory are. And a learning, of course, is the act of making and strengthening neural connections um, and networks of neurons in our brain. So when we learn something, uh, we, we, the neurons that represent the visual information, the auditory information, whatever it is we're looking at, are active. And then when we go to remember it, those same neurons have to be reactivated. That's actually what remembering is. And so when we recall things and are reactivating those connections um, is uh, really the explanation for why the neuroscientists say neurons that fire together wire together. So once they've been activated or have fired together, then they have a much stronger tendency of being activated again all at the same time. And we want to strengthen those connections um, to create learning. So now if we talk about um, how we are going to take in some new information, 
We're going to take a little look at this uh, picture of black and white uh, blobs, if you will. And we have you on mute, but uh, if you want to go ahead and type something into your chat window, uh, you can share it with everybody, or you can send it to Sarah, or you can send it to one of us. Uh, and so if you can see something in that pattern, why don't you just type in what you see? And we'll give everybody a chance just to do that for a moment. There's one person. Good job, Mike. <laughs> And good job, Tim. All right. So people tend to say, I, I, we, get, we do get some different answers here. Some will say they see a cat's face. Some people will say they see a dog. Other people will say they don't see much of anything at all but black and white spots. So, Sarah, if you would show the shading, that may help okay. people to focus on the, what the picture is. Oh, it's getting there. Okay. So that shading usually helps people say, oh, yes, there in fact is a Dalmatian dog. And now we can see that dog because we are, um, have the right cues to be able to do that. But what if you had no experience of a dog? What if you didn't and never seen a dog? Would you be able to perceive it? Of course not, because what our brains are always doing is looking for meaning. They're trying to organize and search and combine the information that they're being exposed to but you have to have the right background and the right context in order to be able to identify it. So the principle is basically this. In order to have something being meaningful, we have to have it connected to other things that we already know. And there are really two ways to do that. One is you can hook information into something that your students already know about, but Remember this, in the case of students from low socioeconomic status backgrounds, many times they don't have the same experiences, they won't have the same context, they won't have the same information already at hand to hook into. And so very often it's going to be essential to create the experience with them. So there, you can probably think of and imagine in the subjects that you teach or in the classes or the kinds of lessons that you have with your students, um, oh, and somebody thought it was an alligator, too. That's a new one, but I'm going to remember that next time. Um, is, if the topic is a dog and you have, your students have no experience with the dog, they need to have something that allows them to really um, create that memory for them. They need to touch it and feel it and play with it and listen to it and all those kinds of things. And you can create those kinds of experiences around just about anything um, that's the topic of uh, what you're addressing in your classroom. So that's principle one. Does your throat need a break? Do you want me to do this one? Yeah, I thought, I thought you were going to do this one anyway. Okay. I couldn't remember. So <laughs> the other thing we want to talk about is the types of memory. Now, we're not talking about just there's, of course, short-term memory and working memory and, and all kinds of intermediate memories and those kinds of things. What we're concerned about here is long-term memory because that's the things that we're asking people to remember. And there are really two types of long-term memory. There's the procedural memory and there's declarative memory. To keep them in mind, procedural memory are things that are practiced and repeated to the extent that they become automatic. Things like driving a car, writing, reading, playing the piano, passing a football, walking. All of you learned how to walk, I hope. Um, and that is a really good example of something that was a cognitively difficult process that you didn't just get up and do, but had to work to do it. And yet you still can do it years later without thinking about it unless something traumatic happens to you. Well, that's the same kind of thing that we're talking about when we're talking about focusing your attention and when we're talking about really... Um, those skills that, that BrainWorks Safari develops, when we're talking about visualization, we want these things to be that kind of automatic procedural memory. The other kind of memory is declarative memory. And declarative memory are the semantics. They're your language, they're people, they're places, they're faces, they're concepts. They're things that you learn. And they're also, I'm not going to say this wrong, episodic. Did I say that right? You did? Wow, I had to teach myself. Um, <laughs> they're episodic, 
and they are events and emotions that are connected with them. Many times those two things are declared in memory. There's just things you happen to know, like your mother's birthday or the date of a car accident or the, the uh, well, for a lot of people in this country now, what happened on ni um, September 11th. They remember those things. And it's because there's emotions that are connected with those particular events. They're declarative. They're not procedural. Although it seems like they're automatic processing, they're really not. They're just things you know. So principle two is about different kinds of strategies for the different kinds of memory. And rote rehearsal is the thing that works the best for procedural memory because repetition is important. Learning how to throw a basketball through a hoop isn't something you just do. You have to practice it and to practice it and practice it. And many times you don't even know what you're tweaking. You just keep trying until you get it. And then once you get it, you keep getting it. And then there's the elaborative rehearsal, which works best for declarative memory. And these are the things that we can control in the classroom. And there's some examples here, this is not at all um, exhaustive, of some really good ways for elaborative rehearsal. As a former chemistry teacher, I used a lot of this because much of what I taught were things that people couldn't imagine. And so metaphors and analogies were extremely important for having them connect to the meaning of a concept because they had no experience to connect it to. Doing hands-on activities and doing visuals and graphs and trying to get as many different um, of those hands-on elaborative rehearsals connected to the content. The more of them you do for the same content, the stronger the declarative memory of that particular content can be. One of the interesting things to me about all of those things is that typically those elaborative practices, reciprocal teaching and role playing and all that kind of thing, are, are things that really good teachers do sort of instinctively about hopefully what we're excuse me, doing here is sort of explaining why, uh, because we need to be able to hook those things into meaning and create those neural connections, why we want to approach it this way versus the procedural way and why procedural memory works differently. So it's really helping us take our understanding of the brain and translate it directly into things that we can do um, to be more effective in a classroom. Exactly. Those are things that, that everybody that you know learns about good teaching methods are using, but now with all of the things that we've learned about neuroscience and the way our brains work, we can see why they actually have the impact that they do. So we, the last thing we want to talk about is emotions, and I think this this whole topic is really important for students, uh, for low SES students. Um, emotions. Um, it can be um, can, can certainly be problematic, and when our when we're in a stressful situation or in a in a threatening situation, um, basically our our cortexes our, our the thinking part of our brains become much less efficient, and we basically move into a fight or flight response. Emotion really overrides cognition, and so any situation, and it do, it can be physically threatening, it can be psychologically threatening. There's some research recently that I um, heard about um, on bullying where the um, physical effects on the brain of being exposed to bullying are exactly the same as the physical effects on the brain from being abused, physically abused. So we used to say that sticks and stones can break our bones but names will never hurt us and in fact that's not true. All the psychological stress and the psychological threats can be ever, uh, ever as much um, impactful as a physical ones. So, um, and this can be a particularly an issue for students from from these kinds of backgrounds who tend to have significantly more stress in their lives, and who really do need to make sure that they are in a safe place, uh, physically and psychologically, in order to be able to learn. But the other side of the coin is that emotions can also play a very positive role, and they can actually enhance learning. It's not just about impeding it. So um, adrenaline has roles other than as a, as a stress response. And we do know that 
adding emotion to and adding positive emotion to um, experiences and learning can actually create much stronger memories than, and things that are much easier to remember. So you have to engage, you have to motivate interest, you have to um, uh, get the adrenaline going a little bit in order to be able to do that. And when you do that, you can really enhance um, kids learning and you can really get them much more engaged in, um, in their own learning. Um, sometimes doing something in a very playful way um, where it's funny can be a way of, of uh, making things memorable. Um, and sometimes it's just simply a way of diffusing some of the tension. But getting people engaged emotionally when they can do, if you think about kids doing role playing in a classroom and the starting to experience the emotions of the characters, um, that can be a very positive um, experience and it can also be a way of really reinforcing and strength, strengthening the, um, the memory um, that's being created so that it's much easier to retrieve later. So, so I, have a, I have a really cool um, anecdote that I learned at a conference when I was listening to someone talk about the emotions in the classroom and how the teacher's emotions can so dramatically affect the students. And it was a story about a teacher that, that was having a bad day, and we all have them. And unfortunately, she was having one that was monumental. And when she, by the time she got to her classroom, everything was just going wrong. And then she had a group of students that sometimes they really could push her ability to handle that. And there was one student that just totally got on her nerves, and she wasn't handling very well, and she was disappointed in herself. And so she stopped her, her talk, and this was early in the morning. She stopped what they were doing, and she said, Hey, class, I need you to do me a favor. She says, Billy, I need you to tell me a joke. And they all just kind of looked at her. And she said, I'm having a really bad day, and I really need to laugh. So I want to, to just take a few minutes and see if we can get some laughter going. So Billy, and Billy was the student that was driving her crazy. She said, Billy, I want you to tell me a joke. And he told her a joke, and it really wasn't all that funny. But she laughed anyway. And then they all just started telling jokes and giggling for a while. And she let them do that and get the atmosphere changed in her classroom. And it changed her entire day. Well, then it kind of set a precedence that there would be times throughout the school year when a student would raise their hand and say, I need to laugh, and she would take the break and let them have jokes. That's a great example of recognizing when the, the, uh, when the tone and the emotions are working for you or against you and then doing what you need to do to be able to change that. So basically that's it. That's principle three which is making sure that you take care of the emotional side of things. Especially for low SES students, a safe environment is important. But of course, the stimulating and interactive environment is important because that's going to get their um, neurons connecting and, and strengthening those connections so that they can actually learn. And I, I just love this way of thinking about it, which is that um, your interesting, stimulating, colorful, relevant, fabulous, uh, lesson is great, but it's important that it's the kids that are interacting with it because, after all, it's the kids' brains we're trying to grow, not just the teachers. So our takeaways today are pretty simple. Um, Title I students are shown, there's research that show it, they come into the classrooms with deficits cognitively. They, across multiple brain, brain systems, it's not just about their vocabulary. But the other thing we know is those deficits can be remediated, and they can be reme remediated in a classroom. We also know from, from research that remediating those deficits can help the students close both the capacity gap, their readiness gap, and their achievement gap. And then we also know that you can additionally help that by using more brain-compatible teaching approaches by creating meaning with experiences, being conscious of different strategy, strategies and being conscious of emotions. Ever since I heard that story, I try to always be more conscious of emotions in situations and train, change them when I can. So I'm going to now um, bring up the chat window. And what we can do, some of you, if, you, if your um, name has a little phone next to it and you want to figure out how to raise your hand, 
um, I think you just put the mouse over it and can and can um, right click or I forget where it is. I don't get to see it as the presenter. Um, or and I can open the phone and you can ask the question, or you can just type in the question. We do have um, a question about the session being available online after the webinar, and yes, it will be. Um, we are recording it at the moment, and then we uh, usually within a week we will have it of uh, up for uh, view online so that you can watch it again or have others watch it. And those of you that participated today will get a link when it's ready. In addition to that, we'll also provide, uh, for those of you who are participating today, we will email you a copy of the uh, PowerPoint presentation, so you will have access to that as well. Are there any other questions? You can type it in the chat window if you want. Okay. There's one, you can probably see this one, Betsy, from Tim. Which subtests of the Woodcock-Johnson to use to determine the cognitive ability? Um, we actually, in that particular study, I believe that there were eight, and I don't remember them um, I, exactly, but I'm sure that I can get you an email with that information. Yeah, we can send that out. We, we've, we use different subtests, uh, but generally they're around things that would measure processing speed, working memory, um, perception, those kinds of things. So we can um, we can uh, provide that list. It's it's in our it's they're listed in our published uh, peer reviewed literature. Um, but also we'll uh, we'll include that when we send out the um, PowerPoint so everybody can have that. And Sarah, was it enough to give a global cognitive score? I'm not sure what you mean by that. So um, I don't know how to answer that question. That's the first time I've heard it asked that way. Overall intelligence. Um, we didn't do the entire wood Wisconsin, so uh, we were missing, I think, one or two tests that would let us calculate the overall intelligence. You know what might, we might do quickly here, Sarah, is I think we have a hidden slide at the back with the COGAT stuff. Yeah. That might be interesting in terms of uh, helping give a perception of this. Okay. Uh, you want to? This is sure. This is a, a, a the cognitive aptitude test, which is another um, cognitive intelligence kind of a test. There are three components of this. Uh, there's a um, nonverbal, a nonverbal, verbal, nonverbal, and a quantitative, and then there is an overall composite score, which is I think Tim. Um, like the like an overall intelligence score in in some senses, and what you can see here, um, I'm not seeing it yet, but I'm sure that you're pulling up the. Um, yeah, I'm trying to do yeah. two things at once. Okay, <laughs> it's about uh, 250 students uh, from three South Carolina schools. Uh, these are the their scores, their composite scores on the COGAT prior to well, the first one was the prior. And the second one is the after. Um, so what you're seeing here is the percentage of students within each decile. So the num percentage of students from the 0 to the 10th, from the 11th to the 20th, and et cetera. So if this were the entire nation, you would have 10% within each decile. Before using Brainware, this uh, group of students scored largely lower than um, uh, had very few at the 90th and above percentile, and a much larger percentage than typical at the between the sort of 20th and 50th. So definitely um, skewed lower um, in terms of their performance on an overall intelligence test. Following their use of brainware, however, the picture changes quite dramatically, and what you see now is just about 10% performing in the top 10% and even higher um, ranges in the between sort of the 70th and 90th percentiles. Um, there's another question, Sarah, about relating this to special ed students and um, additional ways to, co to cognitively advance LD students. Um, actually, she also asked that privately, and that's what I was doing when I was trying to uh, do two things at once. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you can see from this graph that Betsy just talked about that uh, 
brainware has an effect on all levels of student ability, and all of them can increase by using a program like Brainware because it's the kind of intervention that, that really lets them work through their issues by using their strengths to build their weaknesses and then make everything better. We also had a question about whether they'd be able to print the materials that we send them, and by all means, go ahead and print the materials that we send you if you would like to print them. And yes, the slide that you're seeing now will also be part of that, what you're getting. Any other questions? There's a question from Julie McDowell about in the schools that were discussed, do they have brain brainware program for the kids to work on? And if so, how do you get the schools to pay for them? Um, well, in fact, the, um, all of the school data that we showed you today are schools that have used Brainware Safari. Um, schools use a variety of different sources to, of, um, uh, to pay for the program. Uh, the program is very, um, generally very reasonable, and um, so they use um, um, some schools will use Title I funds, some will use um, technology funds, some will use a, a variety of different kinds of funding mechanisms. We have schools that actually require the parents to pay for it, um, and they will do things like they will, you know, grant a certain number of scholarships for parents or families that really can't afford it. Um, there's a, just a, people get pretty creative uh, in terms of implementing this, and um, Brainware is, in fact, something that. Um, can be uh, purchased for home use as well. So we do um, sell directly to parents who use it at home with their students. One of the things that we do find is that um, the important thing about using Brainware to get these kinds of results is um, frequency of use and following the protocol, which is three to five times a week for tw 10 to 12 weeks. Um, it's sometimes harder for a parent to enforce that and to get that kind of fidelity to the protocol at home. Um, sometimes it's easier in a school setting, but there's certainly, again, many parents who are committed enough um, to helping their kids that they will um, do that. So there are a variety of different kinds of approaches. Okay. Well, there's our contact information. Um, if you want to um, contact either one of us, you have my email address and Betsy's email address from the um, announcement about the connection that, that went out. So you can feel free to just, you know, send that or if you need to contact us before you hear from before you hear from us. Right. It looks like there are a couple of other questions that popped up at the end. And what we will do is try to address them directly with the individuals asking the questions. Um, uh, looks like Tim has some questions and, and uh, trying to understand a little bit more about um, all of the skills that are developed in Brainware. So why don't we do some follow-up with you and also Nikea. Um, looks like there's some additional. So we will capture those and we will um, try and get you answers to all your questions. If there are things that come up afterwards, um, as I know they always do for me, uh, please feel free to contact either of us and we sure look forward to talking with you some more. And I appreciate your being here today. Thanks so much. Thank you all.